Imagine being an anime fan and actually paying for shows that aren't available in your region. The recent posts on animes and the Stone Ocean trailer got you guilt trip and hyped up enough, so I guess it's a good time to renew the subscription. While we're at it, let's order the entire Steel Ball Run manga and add a deal figure in. Until you realize that Netflix having anime doesn't result in animators getting paid more. The manga you bought simply gave a multi-millionaire and multi-billion company more money. That figurine is apparently a Chinese knockoff, and you have no idea if any of the money you spent goes to the actual anime. All this makes little sense, especially when you check the Anime Industry Report 2020. We know that the market size of the anime industry is going up every year, with more and more anime being produced. And apparently, animation creators also now earn more money than the average annual salary of a worker in the private sector. Back in 2009, the salaries were lower than the private sector, so we can infer that salaries have indeed grown. But this figure is misleading when it comes to animators, you, you know, the people who actually draw anime. More than 80% of animators are freelancers, which put them in the lancer class for ultimate suffering. Freelancers are not salaried workers, and even if they are, receive the lowest pay among available anime-related jobs. This is a pretty accurate chart from the anime Shirobako, and this is not a typo. A full-time animator earns less than a college student and a part-timer.毎月最初会社に入った時は固定給で新人だったんで出るんですけどそれが5万円で、で会社を出てフリーランスになった時は4万円3万円とかでやってましたね今やっと5万6万くらいは稼げるようになったんですけど毎月月ですねだって15時間
But if you place yourself in the shoes of an investor, that is, someone in the production committee, this basically means that most anime are not profitable. Maybe 1 out of 10 or 20, you get an anime like Kimetsu no Yaiba that you can milk profits from. If you are an investor, your priority is no longer how can I make a great anime, but how can I maximize profit based on the low probability of success. By the numbers we've seen in the Anime Industry Report 2020, this shotgun approach seems to have worked well enough for those in the production committees, but not that much for studios who are not part of the which anime will rock at gambling club. Did I say that anime costs a lot to produce? Well, because $2 million per 13 episode season is cheap to produce when you compare it to animated shows in Freedom Land. Each episode of Avatar is estimated to cost $1 million and low budget American animation costs about $350,000 to $500,000 per episode. At 13 episodes, this comes out to $4.5 million. So even low budget shows get at least twice the production cost of the average anime. And this is why animators in the United States earn pretty good wages. The low wages are even more confusing when you consider that even Chinese animators earn more than Japanese animators. Put two and two together, this basically means that anime studios are underpaid. Data from Teikoku Data Bank shows that about 37.7% of anime studios are in debt. And because the demand for anime remains high, anime studios continue to accept more and more low paying jobs. Then this translates into animators receiving low pay. So. Why don't anime studios just ask for higher payment? Honestly, after a few days of reading articles after articles, of interviews, reports, charts and graphs, I don't know. But we can look back in history to see how this system kinda started. Back around 1960, Toei Animation was practically the only anime studio worth mentioning. Tezuka Osamu worked with Toei to produce an adaptation of Sayuki, but he didn't really like working there cause he felt like he had no control over the story. Though, he was also a bit of an asshole since he did very little for the film, although being credited as the director. Then later, he poached animators from Toei that he worked with by offering twice the pay to found Mushi Productions. This period in the 1960s was when a children's TV show would have costed about 500,000 yen, while a TV anime would be about 3 million yen. Because it was so expensive, practically nobody wanted to produce anime. Except for Tezuka, who said that he could do it for 500,000 and actually achieved it using less frames per second and lots of still pictures with Astro Boy, or Tetsuwana Tomu without the localization. Tezuka's studio, Mushi Production, also instilled a culture of working long hours for low wages. Some say this was the start of animators being underpaid, but I don't know if we can blame one person for everything. Plus, there's the critical difference that Tezuka's studio, Mushi Production, held the copyright, so they apparently did pretty well that their animators were able to afford cars back when cars were luxury. Until, well, Tezuka decided that he was too good for children's cartoons which made money and started making a lot of experimental films which didn't make money. And then the studio went bankrupt in 1973. Following Astro Boy, broadcasters and sponsors saw this as a new way of getting moolah and started approaching studios to produce anime. For instance, Marumiya Food Industry wanted to sell some cigarette shaped chocolate and sponsored the anime It Men which features a cyborg who smokes energy cigarettes to restore power. In the same year Astro Boy was made in 1963, current anime legends Miyazaki Hayao, Otsuka Yasuo, and Takahata Isao were already working at Toei Animation, but unsatisfied with working conditions, they were all involved in Toei labor union activities. Other than labor disputes, Toei was also faced with lots of competition from rival studios and management issues. Although Toei the company was doing well, Toei Animation, which produced anime films, was not quite in the green. Apparently, around 1970, Toei Animation was almost bankrupt with a deficit of 300 million yen. Television was also getting more popular, which decreased the number of people seeing films. By the end of 1965, Toei Animation stopped hiring full-time employees, which lasted until 1991, and decided that they would hire freelancers as they needed to produce TV anime. In the 1970s, the anime industry was basically forced to restructure itself with Toei 300 million yen in debt and Mushi becoming bankrupt. Many smaller studios were formed, like Sunrise and Madhouse being spawned from Mushi, and outsourcing became pretty common since studios were smaller but had to do the same amount of work. This was the time when wages started to decline as the employment system fell apart and it became dependent on performance, that is, like a freelancer. And to be fair, this system isn't without its benefits. Takahashi Ryosuke, a director at Sunrise who worked at Mushi Production before bankruptcy, said that many animators abused the salary they had and didn't have any loyalty. Full-timers at Mushi would skimp on their work and freelance for Toei, while animators working for Toei would freelance for Mushi. Using the performance-based system worked very well for Sunrise, cause it forced artists to actually work for what they were paid for. 
While we can't say for sure that the current anime production system is how it is because of what happened to Toei and Mushi production, I'm sure we can see at least how and why it started. But now what? Basically every article dating back at least 5 years ago suggests that the system is somewhat broken, and that studios should renegotiate the budget, or the industry should do something about it dammit. Well, more than 5 years later of complaining, nothing changed. Right now, anime is so cheap that practically every project gets approved. Isekai after Isekai gets produced because investors have the idea that Isekai equals money. But even as studios take on more jobs, there's only so much that they can produce. Keep in mind that anime has only looked better and better over the years and became more difficult to create. There's pretty much an endless supply of young hopeful people who want to work in anime. But ironically, increasing demand of anime have only caused skilled animators to burn out and leave the industry. So, although there's lots of slave labour to exploit, you now start to see a shortage of skilled labour. Hence why you see articles on anime studios being short-staffed. As the management at one animation company said, as the price of contract work keeps going down, we remain short-staffed and are unable to expand our operations. It's a vicious cycle. If even one person pulls out, the company is unable to fulfil its end of the contract and many companies end up in the red. I believe this is the reason why we see shit like Netflix sponsoring PowerPoint presentation record of Ragnarok and calling it anime. And why Crunchyroll released the homework of a first year animation student and slapping the name of an existing manga on it. While arguable whether there is too much anime being produced, I think it is pretty clear that the current system is not sustainable. We now have a scenario where more and more investments are going into creating shitty products regardless of the underlying conditions. As a fellow degenerate who consistently lose money on the stock market, I can only say that this looks more like formal investing where investors blindly follow the anime bubble. Another way to put this is that we have a huge increase in demand fueled by rampant speculation and a collapsing supply of anime stemming from a major, major human resource problem. That's fulfilling the conditions for a bubble ready to and repeat the 2007 anime bubble crash. According to this article written in 2009, back then, anime investors started producing so much anime that it reached a record high in 2006, but DVD sales fell because of streaming platforms like Crunchyroll. Although many gems are produced, anime video sales still fell. An unnamed producer said that videos are not selling because fans realize that more and more of the releases are the same kinds of titles with Bishoujo and Mecha elements added just because they are said to sell. Japan also fell behind China in the number of titles produced every year and Japan should emphasize quality over quantity. So, sounds very much like what we have in 2021 with Netflix, Blu-ray sales, isekai and Chinese anime. That isn't to say that individual companies have done fuck all. Some studios have always understood the importance of being in the production communities. The poster child of good anime studio being Kyoani, who do produce their own anime merchandise and you can expect them to get a good chunk of the profits back. Their employees don't get the greatest starting salary at $1.8,000 per month, but at least this allows them to actually live like people. And it helps that they consistently come up with good anime. Or if you want to look at anime as a degenerate gambler, I mean investor, creating few good quality anime rather than throwing money at everything is basically following the advice of a certain old man who said more than a few times. We think diversification is, as practiced generally, makes very little sense for anyone that knows what they're doing. Uh, they, diversification is a protection against ignorance. There are also non-profits like the Anime Dormitory Project, which helps lower the cost of living for animators. But all these solutions are really just flex tape solutions that don't solve the underlying problem. Japanese work culture. Touching the word culture makes it sound like something to be preserved, but let's be reminded that cannibalism can also be labelled as a culture. A culture where an animator who was interviewed for an article talking about the underlying problem got threatened with legal action. It's also that part of Asian saving face culture, as you can see from the corporate talk MAPPA studio sense after an animator complained about Loki, which can be summarized into inconvenience to our business partners. And when the entire industry in one country thinks that putting on makeup is more important than fixing a broken arm and a punctured lung, well, animators are already starting to leave. Now, they are also getting poached by the Chinese who offer a higher salary. On the positive side, Nakayama Ryu released the recruitment post in a collaboration with MAPA for new animators. Why is this a collaboration and not just MAPA? I have no idea. But the good news is, the salary is 230,000 yen. While the cynical asshole side of me wants to say it only took 50 years in the anime industry and a lot of social media backlash, this is a good thing for the industry. Now we just need more studios doing the same thing. The bigger question is, what can you as an individual 
do to help the anime industry. Money seems to be the problem here, so just throw lots of money at anime, right? Well, yes, but no. You see, there is a difference between supporting the anime industry or supporting the animators. Supporting the anime industry is pretty straightforward. Buying any first-hand official merchandise, Blu-rays, manga, streaming legally, tells the production community that making the anime was a good idea, so they will be encouraged to make more similar shows or seasons. Supporting the animators is more complicated, since you have no guarantees animators will directly benefit from you simply buying stuff. Plus, doing so gives you practically no benefit at all, since it's not likely to translate into more anime. For this, you'd have to donate directly, either through projects like the Animator Dormitory, praying that you can find an animator on Twitter or some other random site so you can donate to them, or hoping that their studio has something like a Patreon. The problem with both Furman's method of supporting anime is that it simply encourages the ongoing broken system to continue. Supporting the industry tells the production committee that everything is working, so why change? Giving money directly to animators tells the production committee that they don't have to pay anime studios more since someone else will do it, so why pay them? In the off chance that you have millions of fuck you money lying around and are feeling very very charitable, you can get into anime production yourself, like what the individual investor Katayama Akira did by throwing a few million dollars into producing the anime World and Economica. Though this pretty much depends on what you want to produce. Apparently, according to a discussion on Christmas Eve in 2016, Chinese firms had offered 3 billion with a B to certain production committees to produce anime. But the Japanese production committee feared that this meant reducing their control in the property and did not accept. If the managing company can only put up 40 million yen, then the production budget is 100 million yen, because this number allows them 40% of the copyright. In the case that they do accept the money, then they will split the money among 10 different projects. So, yeah. Even if you are filthy rich, you might not be able to make better anime and help pay better wages. Unless, of course, you are screw the rules, I have money levels of rich, in which case you can consider breaking copyright laws and simply paying the resulting lawsuit or something. The other options you have are to get enough rich people to care about anime so they start throwing money at it. Or you can also go the political route and advocate for reform or something. But we do know that Obama has tried to make that happen and look where we are now. Now that you know why your Chinese cartoons tend to be shit, I don't really know how to end this video. But at 200 animes produced per year, let's assume we need to fund 50-13 episode seasons to truly affect market rates. Assuming 1 million dollars per episode, this comes out to 650 million dollars per year. Divide this by the number of clock tower watchers on r slash anime, this comes out to 241 per year per editor. I'm not saying we should do it, or it's a good idea, but it is within the realms of possibility. Who knows, maybe if enough money is thrown at the problem, even Spice and Wolf Season 3 is possible.